So today I'm going to take you through PackGuard 3, uh, how to set it up, how to use the basic functions, and how to get get up and running with PackGuard 3 quickly. So the first thing I want to do here is I'm just going down to the start menu and open up PackGuard 3. And here it asks for the username and the password. And there's a little hint there, if you haven't set a password, leave the box blank. So just remember that if you haven't put a password in there, just leave the box blank and you'll be fine. So I'll just OK that and select Packard Elite and hopefully we're in so I'll just maximize that to full screen so we've got Packard and initially when you when you normally start Packard you've probably got the the Seaward standard um, database in there so there's sort of a bit of a, a sample database for you to to play about with um, so that's the that's the sort of standard starting point really there so you may have those things on um, so what we're going to do is we're actually going to start off now and go through um, the ins and outs of PackGuard and actually just show you really how things work um, and get started. So the first thing is um, with PackGuard, obviously we've got various screens. Uh, we've got the, the viewing pane on this side. We've sort of got the navigation window here. We've got the various options. Um, generally on here we're probably going to be doing most of the work in the, the pat testing uh, screen but obviously we may need to go into instruments or reports or those sort of things as well so we start off in the pat testing screen um, now the first thing we're going to do is we're actually going to um, look at the the databases PackGuard is basically an application um, for viewing PackGuard databases uh, and PackGuard databases are just uh, an MDB file a Microsoft database file so it's just a Microsoft Access database and in the same way that you would open Word files with Microsoft Word or Excel files with Microsoft Excel um, PackGuard opens PackGuard database files .mdb files now the .mdb file what you can see here is we've actually got um, this database open at the moment and you can see the path to the database so we can see it's on my C drive in program data Seaward, PackGuard 3, and it's called demo database.mdb. Now, to just show you that file, if I actually just go down to Explorer, and again, I just follow to the, the path that we've just talked about there. So, C, um, program data, and Seaward. What you'll see on there, we've got the PackGuard 3 file, and there's my, my database. So, in there is my, my Microsoft Access database. So these database files are just a simple Microsoft Access database and you can actually access these files and you can look at the raw data. Uh, they're not encrypted in any way. It's there and, and in fact some of our customers actually do access the databases directly with certain forms and queries and things like that. So there is that level of integration you can have there. But you've basically got your database file. Your database file is all the information you need. So your database file actually keeps all of the, the PAT information in there. PatGuard is the application that runs and operates the database, but all your database information is in that file. Just in the same way that all your writing in a Word document stays inside your Word file and Microsoft Word opens it for you, exactly the same with the, uh, with the PatGuard database. Now, with the PackGuard database, the database is key. That is your, your critical application. So what's very important is um, when you actually set this database system up, uh, if I just close this down now, what we're going to do is we're actually going to create a new database from scratch. So if I go new database, then basically what it asks me is where would I like to store um, this new database. Now it's very important that we store this in a location that's backed up by our IT department or that we carry out regular backups of this database ourselves because obviously if we lose the database all your PAT testing information is gone and we don't want that. So I'm just in my case now I'm just going to store it in my documents and I'm just going to call it Seaward Seaward database. So if I save that there we go. You can see now that my path has changed to database.mdb and we've created this .mdb file. So with the database now, what I need to do is we've got we've basically got a blank database here for me to start off um, 
creating my information within creating my structure. So the very first thing is once we've got a database, um, C would make these things all nice and easy for you. There's a, a setup menu. So if I just click setup, basically it brings me up a little wizard to go through and I can actually set up all the things that I need to need to get right to to set up my database. Now most of these have been preset up in advance. I've preset these in advance, but obviously you would tailor these to your company. So the first thing is your company name, address, postcode, telephone number, fax number, email address. It is important that you fill all these details in because actually this information is used um, in some of the reports and things like that. So if you do leave these boxes blank, you might have big gaps on the reports and think, why is that big gap there? Generally, it's because that information hasn't been uh, included. Now we can also, for the reports, we can also have our logo. So we need a .jpg um, file, a JPEG file of our logo. And all we simply do is browse to where the logo is on our computer. And we basically select the file and from there, so we can select the file that we want and we OK that and that will put the, the path in there. When we get onto reports later on, you'll actually see um, more about where these logos fit in and how the logos actually fit in on the on the uh, the reports. But it is important that we set that up there so we've got the right logo. Again, just for completeness, VAT and company reg information, more information we can get on those forms, the better. So the next thing is user accounts. Now in user accounts, we've basically usually got one user account set up and that account is admin. Now if I want to, I can add an account. And I can add a password if I want to. In this case, I'm not going to add a password, but we can password protect it. And then I can select which level of user I want to be. Do I just want to be able to view, view and add? view add edit, view add edit setup, or the full admin user which is view add edit delete setup. So I'm going to give myself all those permissions and OK that. So next time if I log in, I can log in as Kevin rather than admin. And then obviously all the things that I do will be stored under, under my name rather than admin user. So you can set your users up just in that way. It's quite quick and easy. We can delete users as well if we want. So user administration is quite a straightforward process. The next is the PAT Options tab. Now, the PAT Options tab, um, this is quite important because this actually ties in with how your PAT tester works. On your PAT tester, you will see that there's options for how you use your um, comment text lines. So on your PAT tester, you will have four comment text lines. So when you put a comment in at the end of your test, there's four lines there, and you get the options to how you set up or what those particular lines are used for. What you've got to be very careful of is that whatever you set up on the PAT tester, you set up the same options here in PAT Guard. So in this case, I've got comment line one set to the acid description, so kettle, toaster, food mixer, and I've got three lines, two, three, and four are all set to notes. So if that's what I've got on my tester, asset description, notes, 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 that's what I need on here. Now if on my tester I've got maybe make, and model in there. I need to make sure that I've got make and model set up on here because when I do a download, this is the pigeonhole that it will post it into. These are the fields that it will actually post that data into. And if I'd got it wrong, for example, if I'd got make and model reversed, what could happen is that it would put the make in the model field and the model in the make field. So it's always important just to make sure that we've we've set that up exactly the same as the the pat tester that we're downloading to make sure that the 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 um, correct items are put in the the right the right field. Now there's another feature on here. This was uh, more common with our older older pat testers. Um, what we can use is we can use these uh, short or abbreviation codes. So potentially, if I turn on the abbreviation codes, I can add a code in here, and I could put in, for example, T O A represents the word toaster. So if uh, PatGuard sees in the download in the asset description field, if it sees the term TOA, it will automatically change that to the word toaster. So it is possible to put these ones in, so I could potentially just add, a, add another one in there, ket means 
kettle, for example. Now, this was more useful on the older pack testers where typing in was quite difficult and just being able to type three letters and have pack guard convert it was quite, you know, quite a useful function. Um, with the more modern pack testers with drop down menus and better keyboards and things like this, the function isn't isn't really um, widely used nowadays, but it's it's on there because obviously some of our customers still use that setup. Now the the final tab on here that we've got is asset groups. Now asset groups uh, gives us the ability to actually change things like the frequencies and stuff for asset groups. So we've got the normal predefined asset groups, the ones that are generally included in the IET code of practice. So for example, offices and shops. And we've got on here handheld, IT, movable, portable, stationary, class one, class two. So if I went for say class one IT equipment in an office, on here we've basically got the frequency set up to um, the standard values that are set up from start in pack guard. Now if you decided your company policy was slightly different and you wanted to change these we can just go in and we can change these to the values that we actually want and save that and that will change those frequencies. So asset groups basically gives us the ability to add items or assign items to a vet to an asset group and then we can change the asset group and it will change the frequencies of all the items that are assigned to that asset group. Now we have got the ability as well on here to add our own um, items so we can have an undefined uh, one there. So if I wanted to add say a group for vending machines so if I was adding a, a one a class in for vending machines, so we've got class one, uh, 230 volts, and we decided, my company, on a risk assessment basis, we were going to do uh, 24, uh, 24 months, make sure that's on months, not years, and the visual was 12. So if I OK that, we've actually now set up a, a separate asset group for vending machines, and obviously I could tie that in with my company risk assessment. And if I wanted to, actually, I could even put the uh, the risk assessment number in there. So that could be risk assessment 0001, which actually decided that we were going to do 24 and 12 months. Again, I can put that in, which makes that nice and clear, and we can see exactly how those things tie in. So this is the the setup menu and it's, it's like I say it's really a quick start sort of sort of menu so we go through company details user accounts pat options and asset groups so by setting all those things up um, it really gives us a flying start into using pat guard so that's always a, a good place to start with those